The Keynesians, on the other hand, are going to take a proactive approach. They're going to adopt an expansionary fiscal policy that they hope stimulates aggregate demand, shifts it to aggregate demand too, and guide the economy to a new equilibrium, which we're going to denote as E2. Okay. And the way they do this is they cut taxes or increase government spending. Both of these shift aggregate demand to the right. And the goal here is the aggregate demand to just shift enough so that the economy goes from point E1 again to point E2. And that will close the gap. All right, so Keynesians believe in a proactive approach. Take action. Close the gap. Now that's a short run approach. Keynesians are very interested in the short run fluctuations. So if the economy goes into recession, you act. You cut taxes, increase government spending. One or both of those fiscal policies. Okay. Now, if demand is strong as it is at 81, the equilibrium will be greater than full employment output. If demand stays at this high level, eventually we're going to have higher prices. Because at E1, unemployment in some people's minds might be considered too low, say 4%. If unemployment's too low, then firms are having a hard time finding workers because unemployment is a source of surplus labor. So maybe they're having to have their workers work overtime, which increases average wages. Or maybe they're hiring workers away from other companies. In order to do that, they have to up the wage and maybe offer better benefits. So both those tend to raise labor cost, money wage rate W. Also, companies are, you know, they're uh, operating at 100% capacity. Maybe they were operating at 90% capacity, now they're working at 100% capacity. And as a result, there's a lot of demand for energy, and energy prices go up, along with other production inputs. So both those tend to raise aggregate supply. So the equilibrium moves from E1 to E2. Real GDP, will, in this case, will return to its full, full employment level, but prices will rise from P1 to P2. Okay. To prevent this inflation, Keynesians, again, remember that Keynesians will adopt a restrictive fiscal policy. They want to reduce aggregate demand from 81 to 82 and lead the equilibrium to maybe a new equilibrium called E2. Okay, so what they're going to do is lower government spending and raise taxes. This shifts aggregate demand to the left. This is a reduction in aggregate demand. Okay, so this prevents inflation. Real GDP falls from Y1 to YFE. Okay. Now, let me ask you a question. Is a senator or a congressperson, when the economy is growing strongly, are they going to re get reelected if they reduce government? There are several weaknesses of the Keynesian model. One being the crowd and out effect. Now below we have the aggregate demand curve we derived in a previous video. Increased government spending and, and uh, cutting taxes increased budget deficit. Increased government borrowing to finance in a large budget deficit places upward pressure on real interest rates, which retards private investment. In an open economy, high interest rates attract foreign capital. As foreigners buy more dollars to buy U.S. bonds and other financial assets, the dollar appreciates. The appreciation of the dollar causes net exports to fall. Lower exports, lower private investment, dampens the expansionary impact of a, of a budget deficit. The new classical view of fiscal policy stresses that debt financing 
substitutes higher future taxes for lower current taxes. Right now, our budget deficit is $1.4 trillion. Split amongst 300 million Americans, that's about $5,000 per American, roughly speaking. So what's going on really is we're getting $5,000 in additional government services, but we're not having to pay for them. So it's kind of a transfer to the taxpayer. So what taxpayers are probably going to do is they're going to take that $5,000, not spend it, and they're probably going to put it into a CD, a bank savings account, or pay off a credit card because they know taxes are going up in the future. Thus, budget deficits affect the timing of taxes, not their magnitude. Low taxes today, higher taxes tomorrow. New classical economists argue that when debt is substituted for taxes, people save the increased income to pay for higher future taxes, hence budget deficits do not stimulate aggregate demand. New classical economists believe the real interest rate is unaffected by deficits as people save more in order to pay higher future taxes. Fiscal policy is completely impotent because it does not affect output, employment, or real interest rates. In the model below, we have aggregate demand and short run aggregate supply intersecting at the equilibrium um, GDP level of Y1. Okay. New classical theory says budget deficits merely substitute future taxes for current taxes. Now, if households do not anticipate higher fewer taxes, aggregate demand would increase as a result of a tax cut or increase in government spending and real GDP would increase. However, households fully anticipate higher future taxes. They save instead of spend, which means aggregate demand remains unchanged because taxpayers know rates are going up. They expect less opportunity in the future, so future expected incomes are lower. And the two red arrows, the two red arrows caused by expansionary fiscal policy are completely countered and swamped by lower future expected income, less economic opportunity in the future. In a loan on funds market, to finance a budget deficit, the government borrows from people that have funds to lend. Now, the demand curve, as a result, the demand curve shifts from D1 to D2. The horizontal shift in D1 to D2 uh, may be a result of the government needing $1.4 trillion uh, to cover last year's deficit. And under new classical view, people save to pay expected higher future taxes. Remember, if we split the $1.4 trillion amongst 300 million Americans, that's roughly $5,000 per American. So Americans are going to take that $5,000 uh, deficit, uh, $5,000 in increased government services uh, that they're not having to pay for, they're going to take that $5,000 and save it. And if all Americans do that, the supply curve shifts to the right by $1.4 trillion because 300 million Americans times $5,000 per American is roughly $1.4 trillion. As a result, the real rate of interest doesn't change. This permits the government to borrow the funds to finance the deficit without pushing up the interest rate. So, in the new classical view, there is no crowding out effect because interest rates are unaffected. Hence, fiscal policy exerts no effect on the interest rate, and we see that in the local funds market, and no effect on real GDP or unemployment, which we saw in the previous aggregate demand aggregate supply model. Now, there's another criticism to Keynesian fiscal policy. Uh, Keynesian fiscal policy is difficult to time. It takes time to institute legislative changes. After all, the Senate, in the Senate, a bill that is being debated cannot be advanced unless 60, 60 of the 100 senators vote and debate. 
boat and the filibuster. And so that makes legislative changes even more difficult. In the House, you only need a majority, a simple majority. There is a time lag between when a change is instituted and when it exerts a significant impact. For example, the, the tax cuts of 2001, which included $300 checks to individuals and $600 checks to couples, and delayed rate cuts that were delayed to 2006, there was a lag to that fiscal policy. The checks didn't, weren't sent to people until the summer, June and July, about a six-month lag. The rate cuts initially had a five-year lag, but however, in 2003, the uh, 2006 rate cuts were moved up to 2003, so in 2003, um, marginal tax rates, marginal income tax rates were reduced, and we call those the Bush tax cuts. These time lags imply that sound policy requires knowledge of economic conditions a year in the future. Forecasting future conditions is tough. Now, discussion of fiscal policy is like a two-edged sword. It can be both harmful and helpful. If timed correctly, it may reduce economic instability. If timed incorrectly, it may increase economic instability. Typically, when fiscal policies are adopted, by the time the money reaches the taxpayer, a tax check reaches a taxpayer, or a worker gets a paycheck that results from a stimulus um, package, the recession is typically over. In uh, February 2009, Obama's nearly $1 trillion stimulus bill was signed into law. By June of 2009, about four or five months later, only 8% of, of that trillion dollars was spent. Now we know, now know that the recession ended in June 2009. So again, the moral of the story is fiscal policy is usually too late.